cheddar began its existence as a cheese made around the village of cheddar in Somerset in England. But today, it's one of the most common cheeses in the world. In its journey out of obscurity, it was at the centre of scientific exploration into cheese making, the rise of large scale cheese factories, and the rise and fall of American cheese exports. Hey there cheese historians, I'm Julia and welcome to Cheese History, a channel all about the origins, history and impact of cheese. This is the second video on the history of cheddar cheese. In the first video, we looked at the possible Roman origins of cheddar cheese, as well as its first possible mention in the pipe rolls of Henry II of England in 1170. It was then mentioned sporadically throughout the 16th and 17th centuries as a cheese in increasingly high demand. So if you haven't seen part one, there's a link up here and in the video description in case you want to know all about the early history of cheddar cheese. In this video, we're picking up the story of cheddar cheese as it transitions from a high demand cheese made in Somerset, particularly around the town of Cheddar, to a cheese made in factories all over the world. As with the previous video, I'm going to refer to the cheese as cheddar cheese and the town as cheddar, unless it's already super clear that I'm talking about the cheese. Hopefully, there won't be any confusion between the two. Most of the time, I'm talking about the cheese in this one, as it goes way beyond the town of Cheddar pretty early on. Joseph Harding is often called the father of Cheddar cheese. Not because he was the first person to make the cheese, but because of the impact he had on how Cheddar cheese is made. Harding had a farm in Somerset, and along with his wife Rachel, set about to make the best cheddar cheese possible. From what I can gather, Harding's aunt, Mrs. Harding, oversaw the cheese making alongside her niece, who I assume is Harding's wife Rachel. In 1856 or 57, a deputation of the Archer Agricultural Association visited a number of British cheesemakers, Harding among them. At Marksbury's, they observed the practice of Mrs. Harding, who has had long experience in cheesemaking and were clearly impressed by how she and her grand niece could tell the temperature of the curd to within a couple of degrees just by running a hand through it. These women were making cheeses which weighed a barely believable 70 to 100 pounds. These days, full-size cheddars are around 50 pounds and are hard enough to lift. One of the reasons these cheeses were so big was that they were going to be shipped long distances. However, some cheesemakers took this to the extreme. An enormous 1,250 pound 567 kilogram, 9 foot, 2.75 meter cheddar cheese was made for the wedding of Queen Victoria in 1840. It needed milk from two parishes to make, so was definitely bigger than the average cheesemaker was making. Queen Victoria's cheddar cheese wasn't the first large cheddar to be gifted to a prominent figure. In 1835, only five years before Victoria's wedding, a 1,400 pound, 635 kilogram cheddar was made in the United States for President Andrew Jackson. So not only was Victoria's cheddar not the first of its kind, it was not even the biggest. Even then, everything was bigger in America. The Hardings had developed a system for making cheddar cheese that took as much of the guesswork out of making the cheese as possible, by carefully monitoring the temperature and acidity from start to finish. They used thermometers to measure the temperature and also had a range of ways to determine acidity. This allowed them to produce consistent cheese. The Ayrshire deputation took notice and replicated the system back in Scotland. You might think that Harding would have issues with people taking a system and using it to make the same cheese he did. But he didn't. In fact, he encouraged it, publishing about it in journals and even writing a book, published in 1859. In one of these articles, published in the Journal of the Royal Agricultural Society of England, Harding details all the advancements in cheese making that have been made. This includes improvements in the designs of the tools used, such as cheese presses, curd breakers, and milk vats, as well as changes to how the cheese is made. For many years past, it has been our object to produce the best cheese with the least possible labour, an object we have, in no small degree, accomplished. Harding credits the improvement in quality to the introduction of a technique he calls slip scalding, where once the curds are formed, they are cut and then scalded by raising the temperature of the curds and whey to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 degrees Celsius, 
either by adding hot whey directly to the curds or by heating the vat itself. Scalding the curds is now an important step in making cheddar cheese as it helps reduce the amount of moisture in the curds so that the final cheese is firmer and lasts longer. Harding didn't invent scalding, but it appears that he may have been one of the first to apply it to cheddar. In this particular article, Hardy makes no mention of cheddaring the cheese curds, a process of stacking and turning the blocks of curds commonly used in cheddar making today, which happens after scalding. Instead, it's merely milled, salted, and put into molds. However, it appears that Hardy was using a form of cheddaring, as described by the Ayrshire Deputation in their report. After the curds have been cut and scalded, raising the temperature to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the curd is then left half an hour to subside. Drawing off the whey is the next operation, and the ease with which it is performed would astonish any Ayrshire dairy manager. To facilitate this part of the work, the tub is made with a convex bottom, and the curd is cut from the sides of the tub and placed on the elevated centre. It is carefully heaped up and then left for an hour with no other pressure than its own weight. At this interval, it is cut across in large slices, turned over once on the centre of the tub, and left in a heap as before for half an hour. The Hardings then travelled throughout Britain and Ireland, teaching other cheesemakers the skills they had learned. The Harding system was modified and developed by those cheesemakers to suit their own environments, and led to the Candy system, the Cannon system, the Scottish system, and the Factory system, the last of which I'll come back to shortly. Cheddar cheese began to spread to other parts of the world too, through the Hardings. Harding's son Henry brought it to Australia when he moved to New South Wales to run a dairy taking his father's cheesemaking practices with him. Another son, William, along with his wife Mary, moved to New Zealand and started the Fleming Dairy Factory in 1882 near Ashburton, which claims to be the second dairy factory in the country. I have a whole video on cheese factories in New Zealand as well, so you can also check that out. Towards the end of the 19th century, Harding and the Board of Agriculture requested that Dr. Frederick J. Lloyd, a Welsh chemist and scientist keen to understand what was going on in cheesemaking, investigate cheesemaking. It took him seven years working with several cheddar cheesemakers, and the result was the aptly titled A Report on the Results of Investigations into Cheddar Cheesemaking, published in 1899. He summarised his findings as follows. The conditions which are essential to the manufacture of good cheddar cheese may be summarised as follows. First, a suitable dairy and cheese room properly equipped. Second, apparatus free from defects and scrupulously clean. Third, milk of normal composition from healthy cows and perfectly clean. Fourth, skill and forethought in the making. Fifth, the accurate determination of all these factors of acidity, temperature and time, which can be determined accurately. Sixth, the careful daily record of these determinations. Seventh, a study of this record to determine the causes of the best and worst cheeses produced. All these conditions are still as important for cheesemaking today as they were in the 1890s, and before that too. Lloyd's report spelled them out and backed them up with all the research, observation and experiments he had spent seven years conducting. Two areas of his report were key to the development of cheesemaking. The first was the importance of acidity, and the second was the role of bacteria. Lloyd studied how the acidity changed throughout the process of making cheddar, noting how much acidity should change at each step. He also studied the different strains of bacteria involved in cheesemaking, where they came from, how to create starter cultures, as well as which organisms were harmful for cheesemaking and how to avoid them. Lloyd's report had a lasting impact on cheddar cheesemaking and cheesemaking in general, resulting in more consistent cheddar cheese. Lloyd's report is also useful for me because he gives a description of what cheddar cheese was like and how it could differ under different systems of making it. The texture of a cheddar cheese should be absolutely uniform and solid. Some methods tend to produce this result far more certainly than others. The later leaving a cheese more or less open, that is showing occasional spaces in the interior. While some systems tend to produce a hard cheese, others produce a much softer and mellower curd, which is considered of importance as regards to quality. A cheddar cheese, when cut, should be soft and fat, neither hard nor crumbly. It should have both the aroma and flavour of a nut, the so-called nutty flavour so much sought after. It should melt in the mouth, producing not only an agreeable flavour, but leaving a most pleasant aftertaste. It should taste neither sweet nor acid. Lloyd and I are clearly not going to agree on what makes good cheddar, as hard and crumbly are how I would describe the best cheddars I've ever had. 
So by the end of the 19th century in the UK, there were several systems for making cheddar that largely grew out of the improvements made by the Hardings to making cheddar cheese in small dairies. But there's another system that took a long time to get a foothold in the UK, the factory system. To learn more about that, we have to take a trip across the Atlantic Ocean to America. Cheddar was the cheese of industrial cheese making in America. An early cheese factory was started by Jesse Williams and his son George in Oneida County, New York in 1851, and they made cheddar cheese. As with the Hardings, it was Jesse's wife Amanda who was the master cheese maker. The Williamses combined the milk of several farms at a single dairy and shared the profits among the farmers. Like Harding, Williams shared the workings of his cheddar factory and let other cheesemakers adopt his system. Soon, more factories sprung up throughout the New York State countryside and they were producing enough cheese to ship to Britain. There were two factors that helped cheddar cheese become the dominant cheese in American factories. The first was the work already done by Harding on cheddar cheesemaking, which was brought to America by Xerxes Willard, who visited Harding in 1866. Harding's streamlining of the cheddar making process helped the American factories improve their cheddar cheese. The second was the fact that cheddar cheese had just outstripped its main competitor, cheddar cheese, in popularity in Britain. This meant that there was a market for cheddar cheese and the American factories had the means to meet the demand at a cheaper price than cheesemakers in Britain, who didn't yet have large-scale cheese factories. American cheddar makers started making their own improvements too. One of the developments either developed or quickly adopted by American cheddar makers was cloth wrapping their cheeses to prevent them from drying out and cracking. Cracks on the surface of a cheese not only look bad, but they could also be a place for unwanted creatures like maggots to live. Mm. The first solution was to smear the outside of the cheese with several layers of melted butter, which could harden to form a coating that could be peeled off when the cheese was ready to be eaten. By the early 19th century, this had further developed to wrapping the outside of the cheese in strips of cloth that were then soaked with butter and later lard. The fat layer hardens, giving the cheese protection from drying out. By 1881, American cheesemakers were exporting 148 million pounds, 67 million kilograms of cheese, most of which was cheddar, to the United Kingdom. This was the high point though, and it just wasn't going to last. By the turn of the century, the cheese export market had crashed to almost nothing. The cause of this decline? A similar decline in quality. One way to maximize the profits made from milk is to skim some of the cream from the milk before turning it into cheese. This cream can then be churned into butter. The downside of this moneymaker is that cheeses with higher fat content have a richer, fattier flavor to them. Reducing the amount of cream changes the flavor and texture of the cheese. Some really amazing cheeses, like Parmesan, are made with skim milk, but the problem for American cheesemakers was that they were selling much of their cheese to the homeland of cheddar cheese. So you can be sure that their customers noticed the change in quality. An even more ominous development emerged in 1869 with the invention of oleomargarine in France, the same technology that enabled milk fat in butter to be replaced by a cheaper source of fat, such as lard, in the making of oleomargarine, could also be used to produce filled cheese, in which the natural fat in milk was replaced by lard. Production of filled cheese began in New York State in 1871, and soon immense quantities of filled cheese were made at many factories. Both skim and filled cheeses were thus exported to England, generally under the guise of genuine cheese. Thus, it didn't take long for the reputation of American cheese to plummet. To me, filled cheese sounds horrible. Why would anyone do that to cheddar? Or any cheese, for that matter? At the same time, though, it now has me wondering what it was like and whether it's possible to recreate. As cheddar made up a large percentage of cheese exported from America to the UK, it was caught up in this decline. Instead, other parts of the British Empire, including Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, picked up the slack. And despite the US never managing to regain much of a footing in the market, most of the cheddar cheese sold in Britain was still imported. This prompted Horace Ainsley Vachel to opine in 1937. With milk retailed at three pence a pint, it's amazing that cheese can be made and sold at a reasonable profit. Happily, I am not concerned with certain trade mysteries. If, as I am informed, it does not pay to make butter and cheese in England provided you can market your milk, 
How is it that Canadian cheddar can be sold at 11 pence a pound and New Zealand butter at 1 shilling 6 pence a pound, when Canada is 3,000 miles away from the English market and New Zealand 14,000 miles? By the end of the 19th century, regulations were in place in America to stop the practice of labelling skim and filled cheeses as the genuine article. However, the cheese factories just moved to other ways to increase the amount of cheese they could make from a gallon of milk. And now they didn't have to worry about the pesky export market and those picky British cheddar cheese eaters. At the same time, the process for manufacturing cheese in factories was also changing with the introduction of the assembly line. The large changes in manufacturing practices that enabled low-cost production inevitably affected the character and quality of American cheddar cheese. Pasteurization and standardization, technologies that factories used to gain control over the microbiology and chemistry, fat and protein contents of their milk, drastically reduced the incidence of quality defects in factory cheese, but also made it more difficult to achieve the full range of flavor and character that are evident in the finest cheddar cheeses made by traditional methods. American cheddar became more defect-free and consistent in quality than ever before, but also less intense and complex in flavour. In the 20th century, the moisture content of American cheddar cheese began to rise. If you leave more moisture in the cheese while making it, you get more cheese. But at the same time, that cheese can't be aged as long because of the higher moisture content. So cheddar cheese made with a higher moisture content also doesn't have as much flavour. For industrial cheese factories, this is a double bonus more cheese, and it doesn't have to be aged as long, so overall it costs less. As with some of the cheese consumers of Britain a century before, the cheese eaters of America were also more concerned about the cheaper cost of this cheddar than the loss of flavour. Cheddar was the most produced cheese in America until 2001, when it was finally outstripped by mozzarella. Over the last few decades, there has been some kickback against the dominance of mass-produced factory cheese in general, and a return to what are considered traditional methods. As cheesemaking moved to the factories in the 19th century, most of the women who had been responsible for making cheese on their farms no longer had to make it, and many of their traditional skills were lost and not passed on. As cheese making began to be more automated in the 20th century, the traditional ways of making many cheeses declined and almost died out, including the traditional methods for cheddar cheese. There are two widely used means of making cheddar cheese today. One is to use the cheddaring process, which involves stacking and turning blocks of cheddar curds to develop the texture. The other is to stir the cheddar curds, which is often referred to as stirred curd cheddar by cheesemakers. There is a lot of debate among cheesemakers as to whether stirred curd cheddar should be considered cheddar or not. John Decker described the two different ways of making cheddar in 1893. In the old system of granular cheesemaking, the curd is stirred over in the bottom of the vat and then a ditch made in the middle for it to drain. In the stirring, considerable fat is lost and the curds were not uniform in moisture. The reason of this was that they were stirred drier one day than another. In the system distinctly known as the cheddar system, which we follow, the curd is drained on racks, which are placed either in the bottom of the vat or in a curd sink. Decker then describes how the whey is drained and the curds are moved onto wooden racks, which have been covered in a strainer cloth and spread evenly so that it's 6 inches 15 centimeters thick. After 15 minutes, the curds are cut into blocks and turned. The blocks are turned periodically as they drain until they end up with the texture of a chicken breast. So cheddaring was a process brought in during the advances in the process of making cheddar cheese in the 19th century, whereas before that, cheddar was stirred. So the stirred curd method is technically the more traditional of the two, depending on which point in time you consider cheddar to become cheddar. If cheddar becomes cheddar after the change is made by Harding and the others in the 19th century, then cheddaring is the traditional method. But if it's earlier than that, stirred curd is the way to go. Of course, cheese producers tend not to include those sorts of details in their packaging, so it's practically impossible to tell how a cheddar cheese was made unless you make your own. Cheddar cheese is so widespread today that in some places it's just what most people think of when they think of cheese. However, some of the cheddar cheese makers in Somerset and the surrounding counties have always aimed to keep their cheese as traditional as possible. In 1994, cheddar producers from the southwest of England applied for and were granted protected designation of origin, PDO status, for West Country farmhouse cheddar cheese. 
To qualify for the PDO label, the cheese must be made in Dorset, Somerset, Devon or Cornwall. However, members are allowed to buy milk from other parts of England to cover any shortfalls in availability, to use either raw or pasteurised milk, and to age the cheese in either cloth or plastic. To become a protected type of cheddar cheese, there has to be something distinctive in where and how the cheese is made, particularly with a widely spread cheese like cheddar. West Country farmhouse cheddar can only be made in Somerset, Dorset, Cornwall and Devon, and it has to be cheddared by hand. They can be formed into either cylinders or blocks. The blocks can be sealed in a permeable membrane, while the cylinders have to be bound in muslin cloth dipped in lard or some other fat. Both shapes have to be aged for a minimum of nine months. The end result has to meet the flavour and texture characteristics for the cheese, otherwise it has to be sold as cheddar rather than West Country farmhouse cheddar. West Country farmhouse cheddar isn't the only PDO cheddar cheese though. There's also Orkney Scottish Island cheddar, which received PDO status in 2013. This is what the specification document says about this type of cheddar cheese. The original creamery was set up in Kirkwall in 1946 as a consequence of the milk supply having increased during the Second World War to feed the 6,000 service personnel based on the islands. A hard cheese in traditional cloth cylinders, blocks and wheels were made until due to increased milk production a switch to more modern method of production and a cheddar recipe was made with a new creamery in 1958. This cheddar recipe was then modified with a dry stir technique being carried out in 1984 after a period of trialling this innovative variation to the traditional cheddar recipe. Orkney Scottish Island cheddar manages to distinguish itself from all other types of cheddar and gain protected status because of its dry stir technique. This differs from both the stirred curd and cheddaring techniques. From what I can tell from the PDO documents, it basically involves draining the curds after they have been cut and heated. The drained curds are then stirred on an open finishing table before being salted. The curds are then formed into 20 kilogram or 45 pound blocks. So in West Country farmhouse cheddar and Orkney Scottish Island cheddar, we have two cheeses that distinguish themselves from all other cheddar by where and how they're made. I started the first video about cheddar cheese by trying to define what it is and found so little to define it that it was necessary to look at its history to try and find something to separate cheddar from any other hard cheese other than the label on the packet. So what is cheddar cheese? It's a cheese that can trace its cheese making roots firstly to cheddar in Somerset and then through the developments and changes made by cheesemakers such as Joseph and Rachel Harding and Jesse and Amanda Williams through the steady industrialization of cheese factories. But at the same time, it's also a cheese made on a much smaller scale in so-called traditional cheese factories who use milk from local farms and use less industrial and automated processes overseen by cheesemakers who have spent years honing their skills. Even this way of defining cheddar cheese is still very broad, and maybe that's one of its charms. There is so much variety in cheddar that pretty much anyone can find a cheddar that they like, whether it's mild and smooth, like Dr. Lloyd liked, or sharp and crumbly, as I prefer, or any step in between. And that's it for this whirlwind trip through the history of cheddar cheese. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. If you aren't already, feel free to subscribe to Cheese History so you can keep up with where we go next in the history of cheese. And there's also Patreon and Instagram if you'd like to follow me on either of those. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.